rapid. And that the quality and latency are not bad. So let's see how this looks. So it'll give me a few minutes. So I asked you your top three movies. Give me your yes. top two TV shows. Top two TV oh, shows. Oh man. Oh gosh. Okay. Definitely. Um. Definitely the Cosby Show. Love the Cosby Show. Okay. Okay. I mean, okay. that that's definitely one of the the shows that raised me. Um. What else? I think the other show that that I really really loved was uh. Uh. You know, I'll go with a retro kid kid show, Power Rangers. Why not? <laughs> but hey, are we talking the original Power Rangers? The the original Power Rangers with the original Black Ranger, the original Green Ranger that turned into the the Tiger Ranger, all of white that. Ranger. Yes, yes, the White Ranger. Of course, yes, of course. So Tommy. we are indeed live now. I hope you guys enjoyed a little bit of that banter. If you got to catch some of it, I'm here with Tristan Barracks, the digital storyteller, and we're going to talk about digital storytelling and really creating interactive, meaningful video for the web, for digital, for cinema, whatever screen you prefer, we're gonna get all up in that. But first, Tristan, please introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you so much for your time, but yes. tell us about yourself, what you do. Yes, yes, yes. So I am Tristan Barracks, or like Jamaicans say, Barracks. Um, <laughs> and uh, I am I am a proud Jamaican, that's Jamaican Canadian, and um, born to two um, Jamaican immigrant people parents uh, that were both creative in different ways. My father actually is a photographer, has been a photographer for over 40 years. And I grew up, um, you know, loving sort of storytelling, loving watching films and and how directors shaped uh, stories and, and things of that nature. So uh, getting into storytelling was really such a such a natural thing for me. I was actually um, a, a, a film and television actor for several years. So I was actually doing a lot of storytelling in front of the camera. And then I decided to kind of take uh, take control of my own narrative. I was getting typecasted a little bit and I jumped behind the camera, went back to school, went to Seneca at York, big up to Seneca. Uh, and and now I'm doing digital storytelling. And, and just to your question, what is digital storytelling? It is the art of using new media platforms like graphic design, photography, cinematography to tell human centered and human driven stories, you know, stories that have human themes, universal themes that we can all connect with. Because, as you know, stories is, are what are, are the main tool that connects us all together. Right, right, right. Now, when you look at, you know, the, the filmmaking sort of, uh, I don't want to call it renaissance, but really it's this yeah. exponential explosion. A lot of X's in there, folks. Um, <laughs> you know, where everyone is creating every day and you have the power to create truly meaningful art from your mobile device. When you look mm -hmm. at this landscape, um, what does digital storytelling mean to you now? Well, it means, very simply put, that everybody can has the ability to tell their story. And and mm -hmm. and the thing that's really important about that that point is the fact that your story is important because it's your perspective. It's your unique right. perspective on the world and that that represents your voice, right? So I, so one of the things I'm really really passionate about is is allowing people to understand that you don't need to be, you know, Spielberg. You don't need to be, you know, uh, whatever the next amazing director is, right? Uh, right. All you have to do is is understand the tool that you have and how to wield it to tell your story. That may be through a podcast. That may be through, you know, street photography. That may be through, you know, vlogging and and, and using your know, small cameras, GoPros or or other things like that or just mobile devices. But it's all about telling your perspective because your your perspective is what is the value that you bring to society and to community. Yeah. You know, you reached out to us on Henry's a few months ago. We had a brief exchange there. I've yeah. seen your work. I've seen what you do. This is the first time we're actually having a conversation. I know people watching were like, these guys sound like two people that have known each other their whole life. <laughs> but, you know, that, that speaks to sort of the creative background, right? We're creators yeah. at any level. Once you kind of lived it for a while, you all kind of have, you know, a way to relate, that common thread, right? Yep. What is it about digital storytelling, content creation, and producing really work in this day and age, especially for YouTube, for the web, what is that unifying thing, that kind of pulling force that brings people together, that allows for even more collaboration than ever before? Well, first of, first of all, Everybody loves stories, right? We we all yeah. love stories. We all love, you know, the the Rocky theme story where it's like, you know, the person that was overlooked, um, underappreciated, that overcomes all the ob obstacles that are put in front yeah. of them. So that's the first thing. We we all love a a well told, well crafted story. But then beyond that, we also understand that 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 as as people, as as human beings, we're designed to be relational. 
and mm. and one of the greatest ways to to share um, a part of ourselves is to share our stories and to share stories that matter to us, right? So right, right. because our stories, especially the stories that we communicate or, or the stories that we value, actually tells other people a little bit more about ourself, right? There's a reason why I love the Lord of the Rings, right? Because that goes back to sort of the theatrical um, part of my my story, or it goes back to some of my my faith faith based background, right? Or some of the right. themes of me being, you know, really really inspired by by visual artists um, of of the Renaissance period. So you know, when I say Lord of the Rings is a great film, it's because there are underlying themes that that really resonate with me and speak to who I am as an individual. Now. Now, right. then then other people that resonates with other people and then that allows us to now connect on a on a on a higher level right so even when we are collaborating and creating together it's coming from a place of commonality um and it's coming from a place of of even though we're seeing the world a little bit differently we, there are mm. certain things that we all can commonly appreciate and we're all passionate about so therefore that now drives us to want to work together and create together Amazing, amazing. Now, you know, one of the things that I, I noticed early about you is you do a lot of giving back and giving back value, whether that's through your talks, whether, you know, you, you do a lot of paid work, but you also do a lot of free work, right? Speaking yes. at events, speaking at churches as well, and looking to empower others to go and mm. create. And one of the commonalities I found is you talk about if you don't tell your story, someone else will. It's something yep. that, you know, I talk about a lot when I do speaking gigs, uh, but it's this idea that you kind of, if you have the opportunity, owe it to yourself and owe it to your upbringing and owe it to you know, the shoulders of the giants you stand on to tell your story or else you relinquish that to other people. Yeah. Why is that important to you? Why wow. do you believe that that's such, a, such an important message uh, to, to, to share and, and to really empower others with? Well, first of all, I just want to say you're coming with the fire. These these questions are like <laughs> like just haymakers after haymakers. I'm like, okay, all right, how am I gonna how am I gonna <laughs> respond to all this? No, but I love I love I that know question. You can handle this. This is easy stuff for you. Come on now. Come on. I think man. I think two things. You said two things there. Number one, you know, what's the real importance, or or why do I think it's important to give back? But then number two, what's what's the importance of of you telling your story? The importance of you telling your story is that it's your story, right? I, I know that sounds simple. But I think nobody can tell your story like you can. Nobody can tell it with a conviction, with a level of empathy, with a level of understanding, with the level of insight, because because that's that's your spirit, that's your your mind, that's your being experiencing yeah. those moments, right? So I think I think um, when it comes to individuals be feeling empowered, a part of that empowerment of of feeling like they have a voice, like they have something to contribute uh, to to like a larger group of people than just maybe their family members or their friends is right. really owning that 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 part of their life which is their story and telling their story because when you tell your story you'll realize that you know you and I may not have so much differences but we have a lot more commonalities um and then a part of the other part of it uh, of your question in terms of like giving back i just think that you know if if there's so many things that have been given to me freely there's so many things that have been given to me so many opportunities uh so many so many platforms that have been opened up to me i just think it's our responsibility for those that that are a little bit more deeper in our careers uh maybe have had a, a level of uh, fortunate enough to have a level of success to send the elevator back down i have this idea in my mind that i that i share with people all the time you know, it's our responsibility, you know, if we get to level five of of being a, a professional in life, whether it's creative professional or or in other areas, we have a responsibility to send that elevator back down. Some people might say, well, I'm at the lobby level, Tristan, like, like, how does that work? Well, there's always yeah. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, right? Especially yeah, if you live yeah. in Toronto, right? So there's always <laughs> an opportunity for you to give back, to send, to, to give your knowledge to the next person that's coming behind you. There's always that email or that DM uh, of a person yeah. that's trying Trying to ask you a question and pick your brain take a moment and really give back because honestly it's it's an amazing feeling when you know you have you have the ability to help somebody else and, and i want to double down on that because it's something that means a lot to me but hey this interview is not about me it's about you so i'm going to ask you the question why is it important to give back as a creative and and try to implement that sort of ideology in everything that you do mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, 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 I grew up with, uh, three other siblings, right? I grew up in a, a pretty big home. I mean, not a huge home, but, um, my parents growing up 
always allowed us to bring our friends in, um, to bring individuals that may, might have had a, a rougher up upbringing. And, and our house was just a place where people could just chill, you know, get a good yeah, meal, yeah. get a good laugh um, at a place where they could feel inspired and uplifted. And for me personally, um, I, I just I just felt like that's my responsibility to keep that legacy going. You know, Bobby Barracks yeah. and Marjorie Barracks um, instilled these values in me in, in, in the sense of like, you're not an island. You you haven't created this whole sort of like Tristan Island and Tristan Industries by yourself. There's been so many people that have sowed seeds, uh, seeds, have invested in my craft that have helped me get through school, helped me get through tough times that it would be, it would be almost... Um, you know, it would be wrong for me not to be to, to give back to somebody else and give the right. same sort of opportunities that were given to me. That's all it is. And and you know what? It's like what um, Uncle Ben says, right? Uh, what is it? With great power comes great responsibility. So that's what it of is. Course. really. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. And, you know, really, it's this idea that, you know, you, you don't live on an island and really, especially if you're a creative, you know, it's it's almost hypocritical that you want the world to appreciate your work. Uh, but you don't want to be able to give back that appreciation, and especially with all the things that come into creating art. It is not an individual experience, right? Very seldom can you create art just by yourself on your island, right? So Absolutely. thank you for answering that and giving us some perspective there. I got to talk about creativity in general. Yes. You produce a lot of work. You're constantly putting out content, and whether it's on your Instagram, a little bite-sized piece of content, or full-on interviews and shoots and all this kind of stuff. How do you stay creative, especially mm. when you're doing it over and over again? What is your process to stay creative? I think I think you have to understand the um, the cadence of of your of your creativity. Um, so what I mean, what do I mean by that? Um, I'm the type of creative, and and I think a lot of creatives are like this. We're very much emotional beings, and we have sort of like this sort of like extremes that we live in. So like sometimes right. you're in that sort of creative zone where you're just making work, pushing out dope work. You're just in a zone. Leave me alone. I don't want to eat. I don't want to talk to my family members. I just want to kill <laughs> these videos, right? And then yeah, other yeah, days yeah. you're like struggling to make a one minute Instagram video, right? And I think, yeah. you know, the biggest lesson that I've learned about myself is to give myself space to not be creative, um, to give myself mm. space to just be Tristan, not to be the digital storyteller, not to be the mentor, not to be the YouTuber, but just to be Tristan, the dude that just likes hanging out, watching some Netflix, chilling out with his, his son and his daughter and his wife, or just going and, and taking a bike ride. I think we have to understand the cadence and sometimes there's there's ups and downs even even with the you know this whole season of covid like 19 yeah. there was a lot of sort of discussion as creatives like you know this is a great opportunity there's so many eyeballs on youtube so many eyeballs on instagram and and other pl uh, platforms but one of the mm -hmm. things, one of my pushbacks was, you know, when was the last time as as creatives we taken a, a time out to just get ourselves right, to just kind of breathe for a minute, to to really right. fill ourselves up, so then we can create and we can create dope stuff, not just you know disposable content, but content that will last beyond just you know an Instagram post or two. Yeah, and, and you you touched on it as well, so I, I got to ask this question. And listen, this is gonna sound like the dating game, folks. I promise you, this is not how I planned it. But we have a few other things in common. Not only are you a creator, not only are you a filmmaker, uh, and not only do you like bounce around multiple projects, but you're also a husband. You're also a father. Yeah, uh, a community is important to you. Mm -hmm. How do you find the balance? to be a creator, to keep putting out the content, but also be present uh, for your family and for your loved ones? I love this question. People ask this question to me all the time. And it's very, very simple. Uh, there is no balance. It's always, a, it's a life <laughs> of extremes. That's what it is. It's a life of extremes. Yeah. You know, today I, you know, I, I'll be an amazing uh, YouTuber, but I'm a terrible business person, right? Because I'm focused on my YouTube platform. Tomorrow I'll be a great father and a, you know, and a terrible husband because maybe I'm just focusing on my kids and taking care of them and not really being as as open or available for my wife. But here's the thing. As long as it's not more than two days, you know what I mean? Th that's yeah, yeah. sort of my rule. As long as you understand the cadence of your life and you understand that it's ebbs and flows. It's not always going to be work. It's not always going to be play. It's not always right. going to be, you know, in the middle. But you, you really have to give yourself that that grace to be able to fail and fail hard. So, so there's some days like today, it was kind of challenging to 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 work on a few things because I was just trying to, you know, I kind of felt mentally taxed because there were so many things happening in the last couple of weeks. I've been trying to be very productive. And, you know, my wife just said to me, no, it's okay. You can just 
not do anything. That's a thing yeah. too. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's really understanding that there really isn't balance. There's just a life of extremes and extremes obviously, obviously within measure. But I think once you understand that, then you'll give yourself a lot more grace instead of beating yourself up when you're not productive as you, as much as you want to be. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, so often we get roped into this idea and maybe a fictionalized idea, if you ask me, of work-life balance. Like, yeah. you know, for a lot of us, work is life and life is work. And really, it's kind of this interesting fusion that we create for ourselves. And if we're lucky, it's a fusion that we like. It's a system that we like that we kind of, again, it's almost like uh, surfing a hurricane. I use this analogy a lot, but like, you know, some of us are just surfing a hurricane and we're doing our best and we found a way that works for us. Not necessarily it's going to work for everyone. So yeah. thank you for giving us some context on, on how you do it. Uh, and listen, it might sound, it might feel like a ping pong match that I'm jumping around, but I assure you there is a system to this. Uh, on that note of ping ponging and jumping around and finding balance, I got to ask you, you, when you encounter obstacles, when you encounter yeah. uh, friction, when you encounter things that are not going according to your plan, mm -hmm. how do you navigate that as a creative? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think for the first thing that I, I like to do is I like to slow down. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, one of the things when I was younger and I, and I started out, um, I was very emotional and you know about everything because I'm an, I'm a creative, I'm an artist, and um, so I took things personal and. On top of that, I tried to make quick decisions to try and yeah. come up with quick resolutions. But uh, at least from my experience, quick quick solutions and quick resolutions um, oftentimes are not not ones that last. Um, and sometimes you have to uh. slow down the conversation, slow down your thought process, and really um, double down on connecting with with those that you trust, um, mentors, um, friends, other other vendors, and other other business owners that you have relationships with to be able yeah, yeah, to yeah. give you different perspectives. Because right now you're looking at it, you're looking at the situation with tunnel vision on, right? You know, you're looking at it one way and it's really important to get multiple perspectives that you trust of people that, you know, have your best intention at heart. Right. So then that wow. way you have a more of a rounded perspective of how to deal with the obstacle. Yeah. And, you know, really, there's always a ton of mentors along the way. Some are more consistent than others. There's mm. people we look up to that, you know, we know on a personal basis or we or we don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask you, who are the three most influential outside of your direct family? Because I feel yeah. like that's sort of the first and easiest answer. But outside of your direct and indirect family, who are the three most inf influential mentors uh, in your creative journey? Yes. Um, so for me, number one is, uh, and he, he may not know it or he may know it or may not know it. We're not friends, but, uh, Joe Simon, Joe Simon, uh, is a okay. cinematographer and filmmaker. Um, he's, he's actually from, uh, Houston, Texas or Austin, Texas. He's one of the first cinematographers that, that I ever seen, uh, that, that if I could do what he does, I would be happy. You know what I mean? If I could film like right. he films, if I could tell stories the way he tells stories, I'd be happy. So virtually he mentored me because a lot of his, uh, whether it was his wedding films or his commercial work or, or just the, his approach to, to creating and, and his eye uh, really yeah. did mentor me and, and kind of fostered that creativity and, and that inspiration for, to look up to somebody that, that was where I wanted to be. Right. His ta right. my taste matched what he was actually doing. Um, number right, two right. is um, is a is, is a guy by the name of Colin uh, Colin Chin. Colin Chin is is a Jamaican um, entrepreneur who is in the okay. video and broadcast industry. He he's he, he doesn't have a website. He's old school. He doesn't have a website. He doesn't like have social media or anything like that. <laughs> but like he's super like successful in broadcasting for corporate um, work as well as like for churches and things of that nature. And one of the best pieces of advice that he ever gave me was he said Tristan. Um, I want you to know that that when you become an entrepreneur, the best thing about being an entrepreneur is that there is no cap on on your income, your revenue um, generating income. So essentially, there is no cap on the amount of money you can make. Right. You have the ability to turn the faucets faucet all the way on or to make it be a drip or to make it be just slowly coming down. Right. You have that ability. So uh, so it's all dependent on how hard you work or how you know how you work and what you what you find valuable that will allow you to bring in whatever revenue you want. And then number three is uh, he may not think he's he's my mentor, but he he really actually helped me 
kind of understand my brand and understand the importance of having my brand. And that is Martin, Martin Brown from Martin Brown photography. He's one of the okay. best, um, you know, corporate headshot photographers, um, out there. Um, and, and the only reason why I'm not actually adding his mentor, who is my father is because he's my father. So you said no family <laughs> members. So I'm not going to put in my, my father, but Martin Brown actually, um, I remember he turned for 40 a few years ago. He brought me to his house. We had a lunch and he's like, Tristan, how do you describe yourself? I was like, I don't know. I, I do video, I do photography and you know, I, I like to tell stories. He's like, yeah, but when you walk in a room, do you just tell people that you're just a cinematographer? That's not yeah. interesting. He said, you got to really think about how you're introducing yourself. I said, well, you know, I use digital video and I tell stories. So I guess I do digital storytelling. He's like, that's it. That's interesting. And from that, mm -hmm. that sparked this sort of journey of really, really committing myself to being a storyteller, digital storyteller, sharing my story as well as sharing other, others, uh, other people's stories. So does Mr. Martin Brown now make like a residual off of your name? Or, or, I mean, if he thought of it, does he get like a little cut of everything on sale? Hey, listen, any anything that he wants, he and his wife are, are amazing. I listen, listen, I I love them. They're they're amazing people, and uh, I'm always there to to give yeah, them whatever awesome. they need. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I want to talk about, you know, uh, some of the advice that you give other young creatives mm -hmm. as well. Like a lot of people, especially now, given the COVID-19 situation, there is a little bit of more time reclaimed, whether yeah. you know, you're happy about it or not, depending on circumstance. I don't want to get into that. But for many people out there, you do reclaim a little bit of time because of this self-isolation. And people often say, hey, if I had the time, I would start my YouTube channel or I would start my podcast or what have you. Right. What sort of your advice to those that are looking to just get started? And I don't, I, you know, throw in maybe something that's more thematic and more uh, inspirational. But if you can give us something that's also tactile that we yeah. can actually act on, what are some of the things that you'd recommend to someone that approached you saying, hey, I finally got some time. I want to do my YouTube thing. What, what say you? Yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind is, is take time to find your voice. Right. And when I mean find your voice as a creative um you know, you as a creative in your creative journey, you'll have two things kind of working simultaneously at the same time. There will be your skill level and there'll be your taste level. Your taste will always be better than your skill. Right. Yeah. And your taste yeah. oftentimes will discourage you or not your taste, but your 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 um, your skill level will often discourage you um, based on your taste because of the fact that your skill level is always kind of behind running behind your taste level. And what I would say to you is just encourage you just to do a lot of work, do a lot yeah. of work, um, because when you do a lot of work and a lot of different types of work, you'll find out the things that you really will. You really do like. And also you'll find out the things that you don't really like. And, and what you don't like is just as important is finding out what you do like because then mm -hmm. you won't waste as much time focusing on things that may look cool may look trendy may look like it's working for a lot of other people may look like it's working for gary v but it may not yeah. be your thing right so you got to find out what your thing is and the only way that you can do it is by doing it a lot a lot a lot picking up your camera um one of the things just on a practical standpoint is like people are like waiting for the perfect uh camera and the perfect lighting setup and the perfect uh, computer setup use what you have you know if you're right. if, if what you have right. is your camera then that's what you got if what you have is is your mom's old you know um pentex camera you know it's a digital camera and you can take some stills and do some macro photography use what you got right here's the thing the thing that i love about uh storytelling and digital storytelling is that storytelling doesn't end because it's not in a digital format storytelling doesn't end because it's it's not pristine and perfect storytelling can be just you recording your voice talking you mm -hmm. you recording pictures of yourself or your family right so i think i think um you know yes you have your taste and where you want to go but before you can even go to you know the culinary level that uh, levels of 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 storytelling that you want to get to you know that that black belt level you got to start out with just understanding how to use a camera, understanding right. composition, understanding lighting, exposure, uh, color correction, uh, those sort of fundamental principles before you can get into all, all of the sort of master level things. Amazing, amazing. And, you know, it's one of those things that uh, Ira Glass talks about, the difference between taste and art, right? Yep. Your taste and art. And it's and really, you know, to, to kind of double down, it's not a bad thing when your art doesn't match your taste. 
It yeah. means that you have you might have good taste, right? That, <laughs> and, and and to really kind of lean into that and find out, okay, how can I make this a little bit better? And this is something we talk about uh, when we do our talks is that, you know, just look at making it a little bit better each time. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to go for the home run. Just try to hit a single, try to get on base, and then look on how you can make it better, right? So record your first YouTube video. Okay, you notice that the background is kind of distracting. Okay, so let's work just on that. For the next yeah. one, let's just work on that, move things around. You know, it's all about that incremental gain, right? When I, you know, one of the things you also spend a lot of time uh, talking about is sort of interviewing, creating good interviews. And, you know, I've seen a little bit, you talk about sort of how you shape your light and how you actually direct uh, people and how you make yeah. them comfortable. Uh, for those people that are looking to do podcasting or video podcasting, what are your tips to sort of executing great interviews? And I hate to ask such a broad question because we could talk for an hour if at least just on that. But uh, if you can give us some nuggets of information on yeah. getting great interviews. Well, first of all, do your research, right? You, you got to know, um, you, you got to have information about your subject, right? Your subject right. matter, but then also your subject itself. Um, the worst interviews or <laughs> are the ones where people come in so cold um, in the sense of not knowing who they're interviewing that the interviewer yeah. is almost like, or the person that's being interviewed is kind of like, well, do you actually care about me or my story, right? So, mm. so the best way to build a level of connectivity is first and foremost, learn about your subject, right? But, but right. beyond that, right? Beyond sort of just the book work, um, you got to also be comfortable on camera. You got to be comfortable with telling your own story. I actually did uh, last week. I did a, a, a talk about the art of telling uh, your story, right? For your brand mm -hmm. and for your personal brand, as well as your, your company brand. And one of the thing, one of the questions that came up was like, Tristan, this is all great that you're, you know, you're telling us how to tell our stories, but how do we tell other people's stories? I said, I love right. that question, but I said, guess what? All of the same techniques that I showed you on how to tell your story, all you have to do is apply it to now other people. Because now once you start mastering and working that muscle, muscle memory of understanding the checklist of the things that you got to do to tell your story, then you're just going to take that same checklist or those same sort of principles and now right. apply it to to um, the, that subject. So, for instance, uh, things like understanding what's valuable to them, what's not mm. valuable to them, right? Understanding their, their history, understanding the context of their audience versus your audience, understanding, you know, what they do and how they do it, their unique perspective on the world all of those different mm -hmm. components the, it, it, you know the way i describe it is you're baking a cake when you're doing an interview you're baking a cake you now right, have right. the the i you now have the ability to add more salt or take away salt and put in sugar and flour and butter and water and milk and whatever else right or take yeah, out yeah. certain ingredients that you don't need right but you have to first work that muscle enough in your own life, in terms of telling your own story, to become a really good storyteller, to be able to draw that out of, out of others. And believe me, I am so happy that you refer to it as a muscle, that it takes practice, that it takes yeah. time. Because, you know, for me, a lifelong goal of mine is to tell great documentary stories. And one of the things to get there is that's kind of the reason I got into podcasting and doing yeah. interviews, because I believe that practicing now, practicing often, practicing early will let me be more prepared for doing documentary work that might be decades away for me to kind of see it through. And this is something I talk about often is what are the things you can work on now, develop now that are going to further you and benefit you much later down the line because you need that practice. I'll, I'll tell you this, right? You, you were laughing at me when we were getting ready for this live because I jumped onto my, my Instagram live and I just went right into sort of like a, a speech or whatever else. And you're like, man, you're so good at this. And I said, you know, I was thinking in my head, like, I, I had to do that thousands of times over to be able to yeah. just spit out, you know, hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Tristan Barracks here, The Digital Storyteller. And I'm super excited to be with you once again to be talking about whatever else, right? That oh, yeah. is a muscle. That's just muscle memory. It's not even, I don't even think about the words I'm saying anymore. It's literally muscle memory. But once you do it more, you know, often, uh, it just becomes natural. Yeah, beautiful, man. Beautiful. I, we're, we're almost running out of time, but listen, for yeah. those of you watching on YouTube, we do this on YouTube, but we also do it on Instagram for half an hour where you guys can join in and ask your questions as well. So go to at Henry's camera and join us for the conversation there where you get to participate, you get to ask your questions. Let's wrap this session off on this. How can you, how can someone effectively market their content? So yeah. say they go on YouTube, they use the right uh, title link, description, SEO, all that kind of stuff. Outside of that, how can someone better market their creative material? 
So uh, really, really quickly, there's three different things I, I, I think about. Obviously, there's very, very uh, straightforward and traditional ways of like just boosting your content through Google ads or um, uh, websites like sprizzy.com and things of that nature that will help you kind of get your content out there. And and that's practical. Like if, if think about it this way, if you're a YouTuber and you're and this is what you're passionate about or this is a part of your revenue stream, then you have to make the investment to see the growth sometimes. So so right. don't think of it as just like oh a slimy thing that you got to do it's actually a part of building a business and building a brand you got to invest in yourself but number two um one of the things that a lot of people sleep on is is partnering up with other brands so so whether it's the canons or or, or it may not be the canons or nikons it might be lesser brands like even like companies that are doing things uh smaller things like accessories for cameras or plugins uh reaching out to the, some of those some of those uh brands because they're interested in working with content creators and you don't have to have 50,000 subscribers for that. For instance, I just did a video on the top seven um, or eight, um, um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, music, not uh, royalty free music websites for 2020. Right. And I reached out to the brands and I got like sponsorships for like, uh, from like four or five of those brands, right? Because they were, they were really, really hungry to get the word out about their platform, right? But, mm -hmm. but there's a, there's a third way. And I think uh, this is another way that people kind of look over is working with publications. What are publications? Those are, you know, mm. the, the, um, the, the, it's like uh, Henry's.com, right? Henry's a magazine uh, publication. Also right. looking at um, blogs, right? There's um, uh, the Indiegogo or there's different uh, filming websites or, or, or SLR video shooter, different different platforms uh, that are blog, uh, blog basis or blog setups, I should say. And, and right. you can actually kind of do partnerships, joint partnerships with them. If you have content that they need um, or they can work uh, some sort of story around, then that makes it it makes it a win win for you and them. They have content for their platform. Now they, their eyeballs um, from their eye audience is now going to your YouTube channel. So you can work with publications, work with blogs, work with magazine uh, websites, as well as uh, actual physical publications to get the word out about your platform. Amazing, amazing. And listen, this was unscripted, folks. I didn't give them any questions to prepare. And look at this. This is a half an hour done just like that. Tristan, thank you so much. Guys, please go to Tristan Barracks and follow him on Instagram. Support his work. Truly inspirational content. And he's all about giving value. But before I let you go, please tell us where else can we find your content and yes. interact with you. Yeah, so um, if you just Google my name, Tristan Barracks, that's B-A-R-O-C-K-S, Bar and Rocks, you, you find my name. Uh, you'll find all my content there. But you can also also go to my website www.tristanbarracks.com or you can check out some of my content um, on YouTube, youtube.com slash Tristan Barracks. Um, I think I, I said everything. Uh, oh, yes. And my hashtag is hashtag the digital storyteller. So if you want to see any of my content on social media, hashtag the digital storyteller, you'll see all my content there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And guys, listen, we do these conversations on YouTube live, but we also do it right after on Instagram. So we're going to take our conversation there where you guys can participate. For those of you that joined us, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Peace.